making a game is hard. So we're going to go over the process of developing a game by yourself or with a small team, as well as things that you should be doing and things that you definitely shouldn't. Starting with understanding scope. You probably thought I would start by talking about prototyping your game idea, but before doing anything, you need to be aware of scope, which is basically how big your game is going to be. A lot of people jump into game development hoping to make the kinds of games that they themselves usually play. Whether it's something like Doom Eternal, or Animal Crossing, or something in between, you as an individual, or even a small team, are not going to make that game. Those kinds of games are made by hundreds of people over multiple years with tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in funding. You need to be clever. Be smart with your time and resources because you probably don't have much of either. Picking genres that let you use or reuse a minimal number of assets is where you're really going to find success as an indie. Metroidvanias, where people spend a lot of time backtracking and exploring the same spaces with new tools, like Hollow Knight that was made by three people, or roguelikes, where people are constantly doing the same run and fighting the same enemies, but with randomized layouts and upgrades. If your roguelike game can use a bunch of cards instead of animating characters and enemies, you can squeeze out a lot of extra playtime in your game without spending much on assets, like Bellatro that was developed by one person. The takeaway for scope is that the amount of time required to make a finished game is way more than most people expect, and it's something you only figure out with time and experience. So if you don't have either of those, and especially if this is your first game, plan to make the smallest thing that is technically a game and release it. Next is picking your game idea. Start by thinking of game genres with mechanics that you already mostly know how to make. It's fine if you'll need to learn a few things along the way, but if you've never done anything with online multiplayer or card games before, then you probably shouldn't make an online card game because you'll be dedicating more time to learning how to do it and fixing your mistakes than actually making the game. Even though creating multiplayer games in GDevelop with the built-in multiplayer system is way easier than coding everything yourself, there are still things that you'll need to learn and figure out in order to make your game with it. Lean into your strength. If you have an artist on your team who is great at large character portraits or still images, but isn't good at animating, then think of how your game could be built to make the best use of that skill. Use the mechanics that you, or your team, already know how to do, as well as your strength, to help limit the kind of game you decide to make. And then spend time brainstorming several ideas that work within those limitations that you would also be interested in actually making. This is an excellent time to consider marketability and the actual audience for your game. There are lots of resources out there to help you pick between your different ideas and which platforms you should be releasing those types of games on. So do a little research into which game idea will actually be worth spending your time on and which platform you should be looking at when releasing that game. Takeaway: Pick a game idea that you know you can not only make, but that you can make well, and one that you're confident people will actually want to play. Then there's planning. So many people fall victim to scope creep, which is when your game's scope increases unintentionally, and that's usually because they started developing their game without a solid plan in place. It's a lot of fun to add new cool features to your game, but you can end up with a game that's way too big to actually finish. It's easy to get lost if you didn't know where you were going in the first place. So break your game down into big chunks and sort them in an order of importance as they relate to gameplay. So for example, Vampire Survivors can be broken down into player, enemies, leveling system, and miscellaneous for menus and things that are important but not core to the gameplay. For this you can use free online organization tools like Trello or Notion, then add on playtesting and game polish, break each chunk down again into medium sized chunks, and then sort them again but this time in the order they need to get made in order to make sense with the game's development. Like if you break enemies into basic enemies and bosses, obviously you need something to attack in order to gain experience and levels, but it's probably more important to get the leveling system set up so you can push off the boss to later in development. You can break these down a few more times to figure out your game's general development timeline, then give each chunk a deadline. 
This part is critical, because a task usually takes as much time as you give it. Set deadlines based on your best estimate, and try to hit them, but don't beat yourself up if you don't. Some things will probably go wrong, or take longer than you expected. That's normal and something that you see in the games industry all of the time. The takeaway is, break your game into manageable chunks, and set deadlines to make sure you know where you're headed and that you won't get lost in development. Next is the actual development part. You just take the next chunk on your game's development timeline, break it down into individual tasks, and then complete those tasks. Some common things that people get wrong in this phase are not doing version control, trying to do everything on their own, and not doing enough playtesting. So let's talk about version control, which is basically the practice of making sure that you're saving separate saves of your project whenever you add a new feature or make a new change. So you always have the older versions of the game to roll back to if anything goes wrong. Like if you accidentally delete or break something in your game while you're working on it, or if the game file itself gets corrupted. It also helps to save your game online to make sure your progress isn't lost if something happens to your device, like if it just spontaneously catches fire. GDevelop already offers cloud storage for games, and there's built-in version control for anybody with a pro subscription, but you can also store your game on other hosting platforms like GitHub. Then there's trying to do it all. It's natural as the game's developer to want to figure out everything yourself. It usually gives you a sense of pride, and it can actually be a lot of fun to tackle new challenges. But your goal here is to make a game. So if you find yourself stuck on a problem for more than a couple of hours, reach out and get help. There are tutorials you can watch, assets you can buy, and tons of solutions to be found online. And then there's playtesting. We've already done a video on that before, but most people don't bother doing any playtesting till far too late in development. People are usually afraid of showing their work while it's still in the rough prototyping phase, which is normal, but not helpful. Schedule playtesting throughout your game's development to make sure things are intuitive and people understand how to play the game, as well as to check for bugs and design choices that confuse players. The takeaway for development is just to get to work on your plan and just do it. Make sure you have secure backups to roll back to, don't stay stuck on something that you can find the answer to online, and show your game to people often and early. And then there's the launch of your game, which is mostly about marketing. For marketing, you should be showing off your game and getting people excited about it throughout development. But since we already did a video on marketing, and how to get your first 10,000 players, click on this video to learn more.